Hello and welcome to Nikolai's genetics lessons and this video is going to be about forensic genetics and here is a problem after the crime uh, some evidence at the crime scene were collected uh, hair and blood and here is a fingerprint of the uh, hair sample and blood sample and here is the suspect number one suspect number two and victim and their uh, DNA fingerprint and here is a problem who does the blood evidence found at the crime scene most likely belong to. And here is uh, uh, five answers to choose from. If you need a time, I recommend you to pause video here, try to solve this problem on your own first, and when you would be ready, you can run video again, and you can compare your answer with my answer and explanation. So first of all, let's separate um, evidence uh, collected at the crime scene, and these two biological samples were collected at the crime scene and uh, this were collected later. We have two suspects here and uh, DNA fingerprint of the victim. So the question is who does blood evidence found at the crime scene most likely belong to? And here is the blood evidence and this is uh, DNA fingerprint of the blood collected at the crime scene and now we have to compare with these three samples and as you see uh, this is the same fingerprint as we have in this line and this is DNA of the victim so at the crime scene uh, blood evidence were collected of the victim this is answer A and I have a couple comments about uh, hair evidence and blood evidence. Uh, by the way, as you see, hair evidence found at the crime scene belongs to the suspect number one. So this person was at the crime scene and most likely he commit this crime. So. Uh, can we use any blood cells in order to extract uh, DNA and actually not? For example, red blood cells that make uh, our blood look red actually doesn't have a nucleus. So that means these cells doesn't have DNA. So we cannot use red blood cells in order to collect um, nucleus DNA. But as a components of the blood like white blood cells has nucleus DNA and we can use uh, white blood cells uh, in order to uh, get nucleus DNA and uh, imagine that this is surface of the skin and here is the hair and hairs were often found at the crime scene because a victim would uh, usually actively defends itself, would pull the hairs of the person who commits the crime and uh, in such case we would have hair with a root. The hair itself uh, composed of the dead uh, keratinized cells but uh, the root may have uh, uh, cells of the skin that uh, can be used in order to extract DNA and analyze nucleus DNA. But uh, what if uh, we just have a hair that were naturally shed by a uh, person who commit a crime and we naturally uh, shed about between 100 and 150 hairs a day and uh, it naturally it happens differently. So this is root of the hair and new growing hair just push away the old hair it just falls out naturally and it doesn't has uh, a root so we cannot use this part in order to extract nucleus DNA but still we can use a hair in order to extract some DNA and what kind of the DNA this would be I would show you in this picture so as you see uh, every single cell in our body except uh, some exclusions uh, as you see in this example would have nucleus 
So here is a nucleus that would have our whole genome. And also in each cell we have hundreds and sometimes thousands of um, mitochondria present. And mitochondria has its own DNA. So even when uh, we have naturally shed hairs of the suspect, we still can use this hairs in order to extract um, intact uh, mitochondrial DNA because uh, nucleus DNA would be highly degraded and would be very hard to collect from uh, such hairs, but still we can collect uh, much smaller DNA of the mitochondria. We can uh, also use PCR in order to multiply uh, these numbers of intact uh, DNA and uh, we can use later PCR technique in order to multiply these numbers to such extent that we would be able to see uh, by naked eye uh, how uh, using restriction enzymes um, this uh, DNA fragment of our interest uh, usually we use uh, such a fragment that has higher polymorphism in so uh, mitochondrial DNA of one person would uh, be most likely different from uh, mitochondrial DNA of the other person and we can use such technique uh, then in this case we have to compare mitochondrial DNA fingerprint of the suspect number one, suspect number two with mitochondrial fingerprint uh, of the uh, victim. And this is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Please subscribe for my new videos that I post almost every day. Thumbs up if you like this video. Please write your comments, questions if you have any. And see you in the next video. Goodbye.